Hi everyone and welcome to the webinar today, How Can a Great Chemistry Text Be Free? Thank you so much for joining us today. I first want to introduce our two speakers today. Um, first we have David Ball, the author of the book, uh, Introduction to Chemistry, as well as General Organic and Biological Chemistry. Uh, Dr. Ball is a professor of chemistry at Cleveland State University in Ohio. His specialty is physical chemistry, which he teaches at the undergraduate and graduate levels. About 50% of his teaching is in general chemistry, chemistry for non-science majors, general organic and biological chemistry, and general chemistry for science and engineering majors. He is the author of a math review book for general chemistry students, published in 1996, a physical chemistry textbook published in August 2002, and accompanying student and instructor and solution manuals, excuse me, instructor solution manuals, two books on spectro, spectro, ooh, I can't, spectroscopy, excuse me for my mispronunciation, um, published by SPIE Press, and he's co-author of a general chemistry textbook that came out in the third edition in January 2009. His publication lists over 170 items roughly evenly distributed between research papers and articles of educational interest. So um, welcome, Dr. Ball. And I also have Sharon Cook here from Flat World Knowledge. Um, she is the director of instructor side marketing at Flat World, the largest publisher of free and open college textbooks for students worldwide. Sharon brings with her 15 years of higher education publishing experience, including positions in sales in marketing with Addison Wesley, Course Technology, now Cengage, and Prentice Hall Pearson before she joined Flat World in an effort to bring disruptive innovation to higher education publishing. So welcome, Sharon. And before we officially get started with it, I just wanted to point out a few things about the panel that you have in front of you on the right side of your screen. Um, if you click on the orange mouse you see there highlighted or the red square, that will minimize and maximize your control panel. So you can move it off to the side and open it up again. From the view menu, you can also set the control panel not to auto hide when inactive if you prefer to just always keep it all open. The audio pane there in red provides audio information. By default, you've joined the webinar via mic and speakers. Um, you can click audio setup to select your computer speaker or headset device. If you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting the use telephone there, right there highlighted in red, and use the dial information that will be displayed at that point. Um, during the presentation, you will have the ability to send questions to our webinar staff through the questions pane that you see there highlighted in red. So just feel free to type in a question and click send and we'll try to answer it either during that time if we can if it makes sense or we'll answer it certainly at the end when we'll have a Q&A session um, and I think that's about it I think we are ready to go today so Sharon um, I'll let you take it away all right well thank you Virginia and we appreciate everybody for all of you taking your your um, your time to spend a little bit of time with us to talk about how we got to the $200 textbook and how we can create great textbooks like David Ball's introductory chemistry book and his GOB textbook um, for free. So let's get started and let's do a little bit of a, of a review of, of how we got here. Now what we believe at Flat World is that we have a value gap. We have a value gap between students who are more wired and earn less income than they have in past years, are working harder and are, um, and are interested in kind of communicating with their, with their peers as often as possible and with the textbook, which at this day and age, and you can see this by some of the numbers that are there, um, have, you know, the textbook prices have risen, um, obviously, over the last 20 years, um, faster than the rate of inflation. And you can see some of these exact prices from the graphic um, right there on the right. Now, this is a Department of Education statistics that talks a little bit about the cost of college textbooks as they relate to the amount of money that a student pays to go to school at a public two-year school or at a public four-year school. And you can see 72% of the cost to attend that school can be attributed to textbook and textbooks and supplies. And this is in 2003 and 2004. 26%, which I also find to be astonishing at the public four-year institution, can be attributed to that. And that's, that's a lot of money 
um, as a base of the full tuition. In addition, you can look at this statistic from a study funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to find out why students were dropping out and why they were doing so. And you'll see that over the six, out of the 600 students were interviewed, the cost of fees and tax and the cost of, or I'm sorry, and the stress of working um, and going to school at the same time were some of the primary reasons why students were dropping out of school. So here we go, we have this value gap, and when students don't feel like they're getting the materials they want at the price they want them in the format they want them, they react, and they get mad, and they respond by doing what? Well, um, they, they, they purchase used books. Um, there's the global edition phenomenon where students can go and get uh, textbooks from other um, countries at a lower cost because they're sold in those countries at a lower cost and they're making their way back into the country via the internet. Um, they can trade books back and forth and there's even um, some you know, illegal pirating of textbooks right now. And that's kind of how students are trying to get around, um, get around kind of the, the cost of the traditional textbook as it stands from the publisher or from their traditional bookstore. Um, and what happens then? Well, the publishers respond. They get a little bit defensive, right? And how do they respond? Well, publishers respond by selling less textbooks through um, their more traditional means by raising the price. I can tell you when I started in college publishing, which was, as Virginia let you know, quite a while ago, um, we raised prices at a, at a rate of about 4%. Last year, prices raised, there were double-digit price increases on textbooks. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the bundles that are done. Now those are to change ISBNs to help um, increase new book sales and decrease the ability for used book sales to infiltrate back into the market. And then of course there's new edition, um, new editions that come out kind of quicker than they ever have in the past. They used to come out again when I started every three and a half to four years and now they come out every 18 to 24 months in order to kind of minimize the number of the, the amount of used books that are out there and increase profits for professor, or I'm sorry, for publishers, okay? So we see that when publishers respond, and it's kind of a vicious cycle, it goes back to students, and what we end up with are authors that are unhappy because they're churning out new editions at a rate that's just crazy fast. Um, we have faculty that are unhappy because they have to change editions faster, and their students are, are um, obviously upset with them because of the price of the book, and their faculty don't necessarily feel like they're getting all that they're they're supposed to be getting for the price that their students are paying, um, and the students are unhappy because they can't get what they want for the price that they want to pay, and not always in the format that they want it. So with that being said, there are some emerging solutions that came about to meet the needs of these unhappy constituents, if you will. Um, one of them was legislation, right? So you may, again, you may have heard of the Higher Education Opportunity Act, if you will know about it um, as well. We see it. You can go out to flatworldknowledge.com and watch it. The act itself was um, mandated that you know that basically uh, institutions would have to kind of give the prices of textbooks and put them out in in front of the students uh, so that they could make a decision about what courses they were going to to sign up for. So the price of the book that would go with a certain textbook would be on their registration documents or on their potential course schedules. And it made uh, schools or professors have to turn their book order in a little bit earlier. And it made, it made publishers, of all things, um, be very open about the textbook prices and the textbook prices or the bundle prices of each individual item and always make them available independently. So legislation was one attempt at, at kind of making the price of textbooks and the formats of textbooks more reasonable to educate the purchaser and the professor from, for choosing the right book. Um, e-books have also emerged. Most of you know, of course, Smart, um, which is a consortium. Students can purchase um, a, oh, I'm sorry, let me also talk about Cafe Scribe, I'm sorry, which is powered by Follettes, which is very similar. And what students do is they pay about half the price of they, what they do in a traditional textbook, so somewhere between $75 and $100, to have six-month access um, to the textbook online. E-readers, you can see that the emergence of e-readers like the Nook and the Kindle and the iPad have come out. Um, and of course, we have rental books, so we have Chegg and um, Barnes and & Noble and many different um, kind of options in terms of students being able to rent and send their book back and get money back for their book. And then finally, 
open textbooks. And you can see here um, the rise of open source textbooks. Uh, we seem to think, and, and you'll see why, of course, is being the most profound group to hopefully make a change to the way students and professors and authors um, deal with their respective areas and textbooks. So Connections is out of Rice, uh, Rice University, Orange Grove, um, the Orange Grove project is out of Florida, and then there's commercial entrants like Flat World Knowledge. Um, so let's talk just briefly about the free and open textbooks, um, that last item that we brought up. What is open? So, you know, it's a, it's a good question because I think a lot of people have different perceptions of what open might be. And we live in a, in a, in a world of copyrighted or not. And historically, um, it was either copyrighted um, or it was, it was completely open um, where there were no rights reserved, which wasn't an acceptable alternative to most people. So the rise of the internet brought kind of grayer areas in the middle. And um, we ended up with some rights are reserved, which you can see there in the middle is the Creative Commons license. And there are four R's to openness. One is the ability to reuse, um, so the right to copy and use verbatim copies, the right to revise um, or adapt a work and improve it, a right to remix it, so to combine it with other open educational resources, and the right to redistribute it and to share copies. Um, so let's move forward here. and talk a little bit about some of the free and open textbooks models that we have out there today. Um, so what we've got today here, and this is, this is kind of the first one that came out, which was, which was individuals who decided to kind of produce their own open textbook. And this is, this is an open textbook by Rob Beezer at the University of Puget Sound um, on linear algebra. And he produced this himself, and he made it open for anybody to use and read online for free and adapt. Um, another option are aggregators, and I, you saw that before on my earlier slide. There's places like Connections out of Rice or Merlot, which is out of the Cal State um, University, um, sorry, the Cal State system, where they add, they take, you know, all the open content out there and they put it out there in a repository for you to go, mix and match, adapt, and use in your courses. As we see the, matur the maturing of the open movement, um, commercial options or models are coming into play, and that right now the first one is us, and that's Flat World Knowledge. And um, in order to kind of make you understand a little bit about how we utilize the open license, we're going to tell you a little bit about how we publish books under the open license that's going to be not only beneficial to you, the professor, but to authors and to students in the long run. So what we do, and what we like to say is what we do that's just like every other publisher out there, just like the traditional houses, is that we take top authors like David, um, we professionally develop their books through reviewers. Um, maybe you've reviewed a book in the past. Any one of you have done any kind of uh, reviewing. We do the same thing. Flat World. We professionally develop it. We fully support it with with resources to help you teach the course, like a test item file, an IM instructor's manual, a desk copy, etc. Um, and and we produce a textbook. You can see that the quality of our textbooks is high just by looking at just a, a sample. Of some of the uh, some of the over schools that are that are using our books today, um, but that's where our similarities to the bigger houses or the traditional houses end. Um, we publish our books under an open license. It's a Creative Commons license, and what it does is it allows for instructors, if they so choose, to customize our books. They don't have to. They could always choose to sell books by shelf. But I will show you a sample of how easy it is to customize a book. Simply by going to one of our catalog pages and clicking on customize a book, you can go ahead and move the, the sections of a book down and around by dragging it. You can delete a section of a book by clicking on the, the little um, waste basket. Um, you can go ahead into the actual body of the text with our Mio publishing option. We call it Mio. It's make it your own. Shoot, that's our, um, that's our, our moniker or our name for our custom platform, the Mio platform. But you can go ahead and you can click on the plus sign and you can edit this at the line level. Um, you can save that and then all of a sudden your changes have been included in the book itself. Um, not only that, you can insert, you know, anything you want into the text itself. You can upload your own PDFs, your own exercises, your own solutions if you want, your own cases. Um, 
in this case, you can also even make a new section. So down here, you can make a new section. You can name it. Um, you click Save. You'll see that it kind of goes to the bottom without a section number. You can drag that up to where you want it to be. And, um, and there it goes, the psychology of protest. And then you can begin to start you know, adding things like learning objectives. Um, you can insert a paragraph of text and cut and paste that from something you might have. You might know there's a video out there uh, from YouTube that would, you know, or, a, or a, my goodness, uh, you know, maybe there's a video of an experiment or whatnot that you could show, um, and you click Save, and you put it up there. Um, you can cite it, et cetera, so that all of the, um, all of the you know, attributes are made appropriately. You can add in exercises, save those, and then all of a sudden you click Save, and you have a full new section, the psychology of protest in this case, but something having to do with chemistry in the case of the professors on this call today. Um, and then you click publish. And what's awesome about clicking publish is we rebuild the book. TOC index pagination to reflect the changes that you made. And as soon as you hit that publish button, we generate multiple learning formats, the web book which everybody accesses for free, which we'll talk about in a minute. We, we create the ability to print soft cover books, print it yourself books, mobile reader books for iPad and Kindle audio books, and then Daisy readable and digital braille accessible books. Um, and then that allows students to choose the format that's best for them. So it's beautiful. If indeed you want to go ahead and adapt your chemistry book and put in it what you, you know, something that might have to do with with something that's local or maybe a project that you've done in the past or some exercise that you've seen work in the past, you can put them in. And then you have the right book for your students and your students can choose the format. This is a quote from an economics professor that was excited about the fact that he and his committee were able to alter the book uh, to be exactly what they wanted it. And not only that, it was affordable. Which brings us to our next point. Because our books are openly licensed, they are free online. Um, they're web hosted. There are no codes. It doesn't expire. There's nothing you need to pay for. You all could go out right now and read David Ball's textbook online for free today. Then we produce choices on format. Now, we do that with David Ball's book right now. And we would do that, of course, like I told you, if you chose to customize it. So in the bookstore, we sell our books. We sell our books at a discount to your bookstore, and they can mark them up a little bit, or you can buy them directly from us um, in soft cover, black and white, or color in audio, in print it yourself PDF for students, which they download to their computer and print off a chapter at a time if they want, iPad, Kindle, and Sony readers, and formats that fit or that are readable on their iPhone. And finally, we sell student study aids. We, quit, we asked them what study aids are most important to them, and they gave us the top three, and this is what we sell. So what you basically have when a student goes to our website and types in the University of Houston and clicks on search and looks for their course, they're able to pick from a black and white book, which will cost about $30, to $70 if it's the color book, an audio book at $40 or $3 a chapter, a print-it-yourself book for $25 or $2 a chapter, an e-form, e-reader book at $25 or $2 a chapter, or they can read our book online for free. Our study aids are available for the entire book for about $15 and $2.50 a chapter. So all very reasonable prices, markedly different than what they're used to spending today. Um, on, on textbook. And just to give you some information out of the 16, um, or I'm sorry, about 115,000 students who use Flat World Knowledge Book in the past year and a half or so, 33% of them who come here actually read, I'm sorry, 44% of them actually read the book online for free. 33% of them buy a black and white book or a color book. Audiobooks are 3%, print it yourself is 17, and ebooks are 3%. I think ebooks are going to change a little bit. Um, we just started offering those in the last six months, so I think we'll probably see this percentage change a little bit. So, what do we believe the benefits to be? Um, well, we've got authors that can, can make a social impact, have customer retention, revise the book when they want, when they want to revise the book because they need to revise the book because the discipline requires that. Um, for currency's sake, um, and market share and income. So we have 107 authors today and growing. Um, we have over 16,000 faculty um, who get to start with quality, but they get to make it better by customizing if they want to or not. They get to control the pace of new edition and provide affordability and access to their students. And today that over 115,000 students get free access and affordable choices to not only fit their learning style, but the pocketbook 
and improved outcomes, which is something we're very proud of. This is an article that came out in Community College Weekly by the, by the president of Cerrito College, Linda Lacey. And what, what they had an hypo hypothesis at Cerritos. They said that students um, were failing out, and they were not buying books, um, and they were failing out more than they should because they, they weren't buying the books. So they removed the barriers to book access by piloting three of our business books. And Dr. Dr. Lacey points out in this particular article that across those three courses, the completion rate increased by 10 to 15 percent. And uh, she was pretty excited about that, and we were excited too. Everyone always asks us about bookstores. Are there any inherent values to bookstores? And we always say that there are. I mean, I think bookstores see that their, 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 their mix of products is changing. And um, we do sell to bookstores. We, we, we have, you know, j just like the traditional publishers do, we do uh, work with them and make sure that what they're offering is, is fair. Uh, to students, and um, that we help, you know, kind of still work through the bookstore so we can get money back to the institution, as most bookstores do, as well as um, provide a place for students who have financial aid to go and purchase their book easily. Um, and this is actually this is actually a quote from Jade Roth, the VP of Books at, at Barnes and Noble College Bookstores, about partnering with Flatworld because Barnes and Noble and Follett's and um, the independent booksellers also partnered with us to bring better, lower cost textbooks to, to students today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the presentation over to the reason why you're on this call in the first place, I'm certain, is so you can hear a little bit uh, from David Ball um, about his introductory chemistry textbook. Uh, so I want to thank you for kind of walking through who Flat World is, how we got here, and what we're hoping to provide for you as instructors. And um, I'll hand this over. Uh, to David now. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending and spending some of your time while we talk about not just Flat World, but about one of their newest books, which is an introductory chemistry book uh, that I wrote. Um, one, Sharon, have you given me control? Yeah, you know, I, I, I did think I hope. Let me do it again. There we go. That's going to be much better. Now go ahead. There we go. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. One question that always comes up is, why another introductory chemistry textbook? Uh, there are already introductory chemistry textbooks out there. Why would we want to write another one? Well, there are two primary reasons. Um, and the one was that there needs to be a textbook out there that reinforces the fact that chemistry is everywhere. And uh, that. Uh, you'll see that that's a theme in this book that we really hit quite a bit. Uh, the fact that the chemistry is ubiquitous, everybody does chemistry whether they realize it or not. And of course, uh, we want a textbook uh, that's got Flat World's publishing paradigm and can and work its way into the market. So they convinced me to write one, and I did. And I want to address what, why this book maybe would be a better choice for you. And again, it comes back to the concept that chemistry is everywhere. The students taking an introductory textbook are either non-science majors who need a major course, a science course rather, or uh, have never taken a chemistry course and need to go into uh, a science and engineering based course, but they need an introduction. So they're taking this level of chemistry instead. And one of the things that we want to do is to convince students that chemistry is everywhere, that it is, in fact, relevant to them whether or not they are science majors or going to be science majors. And so the first underlying theme is actually a box, a box feature titled Chemistry is Everywhere. And each chapter contains one and only one of those features. And, and I say that because there's a wonderful word I I've learned. It's called pedagarbage. And it's books that are filled with all sorts of extras in the name of good pedagogy that end up simply crowding out the content. Well, what we've done is intentionally stuck to one box feature that is titled Chemistry is Everywhere and demonstrates how that topic of that chapter is around them in everyday life. Now, to make it really come home, We've gotten a second box in there that's called the Food and Drink app. See, everybody eats and drinks virtually every day. 
And by pointing out that chemistry is part of your eating and drinking habits, we can point out, reinforce the idea that chemistry is, in fact, everywhere. So we talk about carbonated beverages. We talk about percent yields in drug synthesis. We talk about the rocks that people eat as part of their, everywhere, their everyday diet. And without giving away the secret, I'll say, if you want to know what rocks you eat, check out the book. Uh, another example of how chemistry is everywhere is radioactivity. Uh, it's actually a timely topic with what's going on in Japan right now. And one of the examples that the book uses is the fact that bananas are radioactive. And if you haven't bothered to think about that, there's actually an exercise in the text that asks students to calculate how radioactive a banana is. And it turns out that from the radioactive potassium in the banana, a banana has an activity of about 18 decays per second, which you could also compare to your smoke detector at home, which has a, uh, an activity of about 36,000 decays per second. And most people have smoke detectors in their home, so we argue that radioactivity is saving more lives than it's taking. Um, so that's one example of something uh, in chemistry going on in everyday life. Uh, another example is in wine. Uh, my wife and I are wine snobs, and uh, it turns out that because of various uh, nuclear releases in the environment, there's a little bit of cesium-137, which has a half-life of about 30 years, and um, it's very well measured in the, in, in the atmosphere. So scientists know exactly how much cesium has been introduced in this fully became. Well, grapes take up cesium, and when those grapes are turned into wine and bottled and stored for years, as wine snobs love to have vintage wines, the wines themselves are ever so slightly radioactive. And you can actually tell whether or not a wine is the vintage it says it is by measuring the radioactive cesium content. And so here's an example of a wine that purports to be a 1991 Zinfandel out of Napa Valley. And the question is, is it really a wine um, from 1991, or is it not a wine from 1991? I can actually tell you it is because this is a label that, from a bottle that my wife and I drank. That uh, red streak uh, in just right of center is actually a drip of wine that went through and stained the label. But uh, it's another very interesting application of a general introductory chemistry topic to food and drink application. And so I urge you to learn more about the book and what it might be able to offer you and your students. And I thank you for your attention. And Sharon, I'll give it back to you. Great. Well, thank you, David. Um, yep, this is where you can go to check out uh, David's book and any other of the books that we have coming uh, soon in chemistry and some of the other sciences. Um, but let me move us forward and kind of move us forward towards our conclusion, if you will. Um, you know, my the the the, the co-founder of Flat World Knowledge and the, the president always says knowledge is the black gold of the 21st century, and he 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 points to the printing press. So I won't boast that this is my example, but I will tell you how he talks to us about this when he's being very motivational. Um, and, and I found that it was a great way to conclude our presentation today. Um, you know, you. You, you kind of have to look at, at the Gutenberg printing press, which came out in 1508. And the European church said that this was going to be a disaster, and it was going to undermine the validity of all of our institutions. It was going to threaten the morality of our society, and scribes were going to lose their jobs, and they had a whole litany of concerns, um, all of which were true. <laughs> Morality was threatened as, as pornography quickly became the best-selling item to come off of the presses. The church's authority was threatened by the first mass media event being the publication of the 95 Treaties by Martin Luther. But we don't look back um, at 1508 and the printing press and say, wow, was that a train wreck. We don't say it was horrible. Um, we consider it a marker for the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment when knowledge of all kinds was spread like wildfire through the world. And the same stands before us now with the internet. And we have a choice. We have a choice to either embrace uh, the new models and move forward and dig in and, and, and move forward with, 
with new opportunities for both ourselves and our students, or we could we could dig in um, with older ones that are no longer optimized and may not be um, suiting the people who our decisions affect the, in the best way that they could today. So that's how he always talks to us about what we've got with Flat World Knowledge. We are, we're very proud to have the ability and um, the excitement behind delivering hopefully a better product for you, for your students, and for our authors. We thank you very much for spending time with us today. And I, I encourage you to submit questions to us now. We're, we're opening the floor up to talk with you a little bit about, obviously, the book and the model. And, um, and please, once this call is over, make sure that you visit our website and you dig in and get all the information that you need. So thank you very, very much on behalf of myself and David. OK, I, this is Virginia. And I, have, I do have a, a few questions here that have come in. And David, I'm going to direct this first one to you. Um, and the question is, how appropriate is your textbook for high school students, whether or not they're honors level students? I think it's, it's very appropriate. Um, the introductory chemistry course taught at the university level, I think, is very similar to what is taught at the high school level. Um, I'm actually working with a couple of colleagues who are high school teachers here in the greater Cleveland area to maybe class test the book with their students to see if something needs to be tweaked or if uh, it's appropriate as it stands to use in your normal high school course. So I'm very excited that this introductory chemistry book has that potential. OK, great. Thank you. Um, another question here is, and this is actually um, more directed towards Sharon. And this is, um, you know, how do I go about actually customizing a book? Do I have to just type right into the platform, or can I upload materials? You can do both. Um, you have the opportunity. That's a great question. I mean, you have an opportunity with our, our materials to both type right into what's already there and edit down to the line level. Um, but just as of this week, hooray, um, you also have the ability to upload your own materials uh, to our to our platform. Um, for instance, we have people that just that do a lot of their own case studies that are geographically um, important to their content, and then we have folks that have their own sets of of you know fantastic exercises or even quizzes that we have a we have a professor that used to give like a book of, of quizzes that if you would practice these quizzes you'd be all set with um, whatever you were you know whatever you're going to be testing on at the midterm and so now uh, she has actually upload she's planning on uploading those uh, after each appropriate section or chapter of the book and now she doesn't have to have a separate item that needs to be a purchased and it can be right there um, in the online version of her free textbook so um, you know the you have, that was a long answer. <laughs> the short answer is you can do either. You can do either. OK. And kind of sort of a follow-up to that is a question. Um, can teachers, and this is for you, Sharon, can teachers link straight to a customized textbook? Or do students always have to search by school, as was previously demonstrated? All the student, to find their textbook, a student can search in a, in a variety of with a variety of items. Um, they can search by their professor's name. They can search by the school. They can search by the book if they knew that. Um, so there are really a variety of different parameters. When a professor adopts a Flat World Knowledge textbook, they fill out a form that has their information on it, their school's information on it. And we do file uh, our adoptions by school for people who just want to search it that way. But we also have other search capabilities. And that, that actual book uh, goes up for, for that individual professor's adoption. And the student would find that adoption information. It would look like a course for them or their book. And they would, um, they would go ahead and, and when they land there, they can click on the option to either make a purchase of the textbook or to start reading immediately. Um, or to start reading immediately and purchase at a different time. So we find that if your feedback to our students, many students go out now. They find their course and their book. They begin reading and they purchase so while they're waiting for their book to be shipped to them, they're still accessing their textbook um, quickly and easily. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and one last question here, um, at least right now, is how exactly are we able to not force instructors to roll over to new editions? Can you elaborate a little bit on that more, Sharon? Yeah, no, I can. I can talk about that. In, I can talk about, about that in a lot of depth. Um, but I think probably the easiest. I could show some slides on it, but I think probably the easiest thing to do to explain this is that the reason that the traditional publishers force, if you will, new editions now are to get rid of stock of old editions so there will not be used books in the market and they can continue to generate revenue through the new textbook model so that bookstores will have to purchase their new textbooks from the traditional publisher. Because our books are, in a lot of cases, some of them are customized, but because our books are not are less expensive, less go back into the used book market. We don't need you. We don't need to, to force a new edition on a professor because, oh, we, we keep our old editions active online for free and we print on demand. So if a, if a, if a student is using version 1.1 of David Ball's textbook, um, he or she can always go back and purchase that book and we print it on demand. Um, we don't have stock. So if, if another professor adopts version 1.2, of David Ball's introductory chemistry book, whenever that student orders, we print that book on demand. And we have less of a used book, um, like I said, market, so we don't, we don't need to force anybody into those editions. And, and to be perfectly transparent, our goal is really to have you look at our textbooks, like them a lot, and add just a little something of your own in there. So it becomes optimal for your course, and uh, your students will want it, will want to keep it, will want to purchase it. and um, we won't ever have to ask you to go to a new edition. We'll just ask you to update your own. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, and that's the last of the questions that I have here, Sharon. Well, perfect. I, I well, it was perfect timing actually, because I, I think um, when we set this up, we we had hoped that we would only keep you for about forty-five minutes. It looks as though that's what we've done. Once again, I appreciate all of your time. Um, uh, with us today, please go out and and take a look at at our at our catalog. And I will say um, that you will receive a follow up email from this event that will have the recorded version of this webcast available for you. And um, you will also see once this event ends, you will see a, a survey. Please uh, do fill that survey out. It's only a couple questions, and it really does help us to improve uh, our offerings as far as webcasts go. So thank you again. Enjoy your day. And we'll hope to uh, speak with you soon. Bye now. Bye.